What's up, everyone? I'm Dimitri Stanimirov, and I'm a London-based SaaS entrepreneur and operator. I've been in the talent acquisition space for the better part of a decade, but spent the last couple of years building machine learning forecasting software for sales. After a brief hiatus, I'm back in the talent acquisition space, having recently joined Handshake, the world's largest early talent network, as head of EMEA. In this podcast series, I catch up with some of my old industry friends and thought leaders to discuss the latest trends in the emerging talent space. I speak to some of our employer partners who provide tactical advice on how to best identify, attract, and engage early talent. And lastly, I chat to some of my colleagues here at Handshake, giving you a behind the scene peek into how the world's fastest growing edtech company is being built. We're live. Uh, and normally we start off with a quick introduction. So if you don't mind just giving us a quick intro and then we'll take it from there. Okay, yep. Hi, I'm Steph Bishop. I am um, the founder and a future talent consultant at Tomorrow's Talent. Um, so we help uh, employers to either set up or enhance their early careers programs or reskilling programs um, with a big focus on diversity and inclusion. Excellent. And we're going to talk about future talent in a second. Um, I, I wanted to start off by um, um, talking about some of the work that you did um, for Capgemini. Um, mm-hmm. So um, if you can tell us a little bit more about it, one of the things that really stood out for me um, when you were there, you, you, you won tons of awards. So best social mobility strategy, best apprenticeship program, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that I thought was fascinating was um, the um, implementation of the female targeted uh, attraction strategy, which yeah. led uh, to an increase in volume of female hires from 27 to 50, which mm-hmm. which is incredible. So I thought we'll start there because I think this is on everyone's mind right now. But And so mm-hmm. while everyone wants to do it, not many people know how to get it yeah. right. Um, yeah. And so I thought we can we can start there just yeah, you know, kind of yeah. talking, talking about that and what you guys yeah. did, how we panned of out, course. et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy. (laughs) It took a number of years to get up to 50%. Um, When I first started, um, yeah, it was 27%. So I joined in 2015. Um, We had to do a lot of work with the um, the hiring community because they were quite fixated on computer science graduates. Um, Mm. So for their software development role, they required graduates to have a computer science degree. And as we all well know, there's not very many females, about 13% of computer science students are females. So if we were going to reach that, then we're going to have to change that requirement. Um, so we did. And it was more looking for people who had a passion and an aptitude to, to learn software development. And then we could upskill them with the skills that they needed. So that was one thing that we did. So it was looking at our job descriptions as well to make sure that they're really inclusive for females and, and the language that we're using is, is different and, and wouldn't put females off from applying. We also kind of had to invest quite heavily in the channels that we we're using. So mm. working with different providers to um, do some targeted attraction um, and run events um, purely for females so that we could get that pipeline in um, of females. Um, also, we, we ran a reskilling program for graduates who um, hadn't studied um, computer science. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't exclusively for females, but 75% of the um, wow. of the candidates were, were females. So we, we brought them in, they'd studied a range of things from history, English, so totally not tech, but um, we then worked with an apprenticeship provider to um, put them on a boot camp. So they had a three month boot camp, and at the end of that, they were junior developers. So it was making sure that they had the aptitude to learn. Um, so it was a whole variety of different activities, but yeah, so looking at what our proposition was and, yeah. and taking people on potential rather than um, expecting them to have the skills to hit the ground running. Um, that, that took a long time to, to get the investment from the business. And But as, a, as an organisation, we were really, um, really focused on increasing the volume of, of females. Um, and so we had support from, from Firebomb to, to make it happen. Um, so And then, then it was making sure our recruitment process was, was fair and there was no adverse impact on females as they came through. So yeah it was a whole range of things but um yeah I was really yes really pleased with with the outcome could we could you could you elaborate on the last point you made that's really interesting I guess you know what we're touching upon is unconscious bias so when you say there was no adverse effects for females in the recruiting process can you actually talk a little bit about this 
Yeah, sure. So we um, trained our managers. All of our managers had to go through unconscious bias training. Um, we also um, we worked with a, 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 a an assessment and design uh, company, and mm-hmm. they they designed the process as well, so that and and had all the kind of psychology behind it to make sure that that can. And then we tracked it. So I mean, tracking. Is, is super important for any DNI um, program. So you understand where you are and where you want to get to, and mm. then yeah, you, tracking that, having a dashboard you know, every week to see how candidates are performing through the process and making sure that people from certain backgrounds aren't performing differently than than other people. So it was yeah, looking at the data and just making sure that the candidates were progressing through equally, um, yeah. and there were no kind of yeah alarming things happening within our process. Yeah, and and, uh, and and earlier you mentioned the the um, the upskilling um, piece when when you designed the program. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? What what it looked like, how it performed? It was obviously. an apprenticeship program. So um, right. we we yeah, it was a level four software development apprenticeship program. Um, it was a twelve month program, but all the training because an apprenticeship has to be twelve months. But all the training was up front, um, and then it had projects and things to do um, throughout, and then you'd have your endpoint assessment. Um, after 12 months and then you'd have a level four yeah, apprenticeship in software development so and that worked really well I mean the the training that, that was great um that the, the individual was into it was intense because it was yeah, yeah, yeah. five days a week um yeah really and, and actually the the hurdles they had to jump through to get onto the program were difficult but for the right reasons because it was a challenging program um and they all got through it <laughs> so yeah yeah it's true Good, good thing to do and I think you know reskilling programs are, are super important in this in this climate as well where we're seeing so many um industries being impacted by by the economic downturn um I think people have to just be quite flexible about what they what they were planning to do as a career and might not be you know there might not be opportunities in there so doing something like a an apprenticeship um after you've finished university if you haven't studied something is a good good way to make sure you've got skills um that are going to Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm slightly going to shift gears here and, and um, kind of talk about the elephant in the room, which is COVID, of course. Okay. Um, so um, the question I've got, you, you did this really interesting blog post. I thought it was really fascinating, kind of looking into the crystal ball and what we can expect to happen well, kind of in the, the short to midterm, but also long term. So um w- would love to hear your thoughts on um what COVID has meant for 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 employers in particular, and um, yeah. how it will affect the future talent landscape in in general. So you kind of outlined. I think you had like five points um, in that blog post, which I thought were really really neat. Um, but it'd be it'd be nice to talk about this uh, in a bit more depth. Yeah, that blog post is when when COVID was first happening. So I think yeah, and I think they so rapidly. It. I think a lot of think, them actually are like yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe um, yeah, futuristic neg or something. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so I think that um, yeah, the 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 rate of acceleration over the last few months. So th- that things have happened that people are planning two three years down the line have happened yeah. in the last few months. It's been incredible the way employers have responded to the the challenges that that have been faced. Um, so I think you know virtualization has is, has been amazing how employers have been able to quickly turn around their recruitment processes to being online um, is, is, is so and, and seen great success with it. So some of the employers I've been speaking with have, have, are probably not going to go back to face-to-face assessments. Maybe there'll probably be a bit of a hybrid, but um, from, from my experience when I was at Capgemini, like, it was a nightmare, logistical nightmare organising um, assessment centres. Um, yeah. so, so trying to get everybody into the same place and have it getting rooms availability and things like that. It was such a challenge. So being able to do that, um, it, it just much more efficiently. I think some yeah. of that will continue. Um, I think that there there will still be a place for face to face assessment because I don't think you'll ever get really to know the culture of an organisation and to be able to ask the informal questions during breaks and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you know there'll be a mix and um, maybe where it's difficult and the logistics 
logistically challenging, then um, yeah, virtual will continue. Um, I also think that from a um, social mobility perspective, there's pros and cons. Yeah. So some some people from disadvantaged backgrounds may have not have the technology or the environment um, to be able to participate fully in an assessment process. Um, but employers have responded to that. Some are opening up their offices to enable people to come in and actually do have the tech and can participate yeah. in it, but, but within a, within the right environment with the right technology, which is which is fantastic. Um, and and then continually on the virtualization, so internships as well, um, moved online, um, and now we're going into the campaigns for next year to attract candidates. It's, it's the attraction events of all moved online. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and I think that, that that's a positive, and that, that catching on with doing an awful lot virtually anyway. We're using lots of digital ways to attract candidates um, and running you know, virtual events. But I think you know this is just taking it on to the next level. Yeah. And um and, and again, I think that's good for reaching a wider set of candidates. So you, you, your talent pool is going to be much broader because you can reach reach many more people than than you could have done if you were yep. to travel around to universities and schools. Um, so I think that's a positive thing. But again, we've always got the social mobility, you know, and people who may not have access to to the technology and, and employers just need to be sympathetic to that and yep. think about how they're going to reach those sorts of um, candidates. So, so what do you think employers can do? You obviously mentioned that some have started opening up their offices and providing um, technology uh, for candidates who, who who might be at a disadvantage, so they don't miss out. But is there anything else that you think employers can do um, to to help out here, given the current situation? I think you know, t- making use of things like the Kickstart program the government have launched. If you're able to um, support people who are facing long-term unemployment, that would be amazing. So mm. um, the Kickstart program is, you know, they, the government are paying the salaries of these individuals. So it's like 25 hours a week on national yep. minimum wage for six months. So that's fantastic, and um, I'm helping support as well because you have to have 30 uh, individuals to. Um, to apply for the Kickstart program, so I'm working with with employers to try and try and consolidate that. Um, so yes, if anyone is interested in getting a Kickstart, do let me know um, because we can help help make that happen. Um, so yeah, things like the Kickstart program, the apprenticeships as well. So um, I know apprenticeships are are, are quite difficult um, at the moment um, in terms of the twenty percent off the job. He, I'm speaking to a lot of small employers who say they just can't give the individual that 20% off the job. So mm. flexibility with the um, the apprenticeship levy is required from the government, um, both for um, yeah supporting the apprentices um, and and maybe extending apprenticeship so it's not maybe 20% over 12 months, maybe into 24 months. So there's things the government need to do as well as employers. But um, yeah, for organisations that are looking to invest in growing their own talent, then looking at the Kickstart programme, looking at apprenticeships um, and traineeships to create opportunities where they can um, will be really helpful to get the, the economy and, and back yeah. on its feet and to support young people in this difficult time. Yeah. And and talking of, of young people, so we, we mentioned some of the challenges the employers are going to face um, during COVID um, and have been actually facing. Um, but obviously, the, the the future prospects for young people have been severely impacted as well um, by, by COVID. Can we um, talk about what you've seen talking to employers on that, that front? Yeah, I mean, we are seeing a huge unemployment levels for young people. So I think the stat that was provided most recently um, for the ANS was about 480,000 people um, have been uh, been, been made unemployed since the start of the year. And 60% of those are 16 to 24 year olds. So it's not great is it no. and I feel so bad for these young people coming out of education and facing the the, the job market and they you know even there was backup plan you know, get a little part-time job to fill there they've been reduced significantly because a lot of those are in um, sort of hospitality or retail um, and those, those are the sectors that have, have been impacted mostly so mm. it is a really difficult time um, and the number of graduate opportunities has, has decreased 
increased by about 40%. Of course, uh, there was a Sutton Trust um, came up with that um, yep. that stat. So, yeah, it's, it, it is a difficult time. Um, and I think, you know, the Resolution Foundation are talking about the long-term scarring effects from the, the last economic downturn in 2008 and 2009 and looking at them kind of fast forward it, and they're, they're, they're still, their they're unemployment levels of those people who were impacted in the, in the last economic downturn, their, their, um, their outcomes and employability is much less than those people that graduated wow. beyond this. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to have a long-term scarring effect on those individuals because they... Oh, you know, the well-being is going it can't be great can it you know you're looking for a job there's a, the, the the competition is so high and and you're looking for opportunities as is everybody else so they or the, the, the supply is, is outstripping the demand for roles so it's going to be a difficult time and um yeah whatever employers can do to support those individuals i think would yeah. be good um it's just, it is a difficult time but you know there, there are grassroots i'm seeing lots more kind of opportunities being advertised so the more jobs are are coming online um so this grassroots but yeah we're just about to head into the second wave and you just don't know what the impact of that's going to be yeah and and you mentioned earlier that young people are going to be disproportionately affected by this based on socioeconomic status etc so um one of the things that you touched upon was this idea of um making the um recruitment process as inclusive inclusive as, as possible can we actually you know because that's all well being said and everyone kind of says oh yeah we're going to make our process as inclusive as possible but how do you actually if we can talk about practical steps if i'm an employer and yeah. i want to make my process as inclusive as possible what do i actually do how do i yeah, go about I think, doing it yeah first of all yeah we get this quite a lot of clients come to me saying right like, well i need to focus on diversity and inclusion particularly considering what's happened over the over the summer um and trying to understand actually what do they mean by that so having real clarity on what your ambitions are what you're trying to achieve and what is where what's your starting point so having the data around your um your workforce and understanding their backgrounds and then working out what it is that you're trying to achieve um and then setting the plan to get there so first of all it's that understanding of what what is it you're trying to achieve who are you trying to um yeah attract a certain type of um, person so do you want to attract more black people or females so understanding what is it that you're trying to achieve is yeah. the first thing you need to do um, and then think about you know how are you going to attract these people and um, what is what's your current attraction strategy and what is what are the results from that so data is super important in, yeah. in recruitment but particularly for DNI. and um, so look at your attraction strategy what's working what's not working and then making sure what channels you're using are attracting the broadest range of candidates possible. So you're reaching kind of volume, but also thinking about if you're looking to attract um, you know, more black people, then what, what, are the, what are the channels that they're looking at? Are there um, different partners that you can work on to ensure that you're reaching those types of candidate? And so, and then it's thinking about, um, yeah, accessibility to jobs as well so thinking about you know your job adverts I mean I've, I've been looking at quite a few job adverts recently and there's some appalling <laughs> job adverts yeah. out there um so it's making sure you're using the right language and making sure that you're being really transparent about what the opportunity is and what it's like to work in the organization and not selling the dream that's not reality and making yeah. sure that that messaging is consistent throughout the process as well um, so language is super important. So yeah, using the right, the right, the right terms and things. So not to put off people from applying to yeah. you. Um, and then we spoke earlier about the um, the process. So making sure that there's no barriers to entry. So um, I think you know at the moment companies need to be really really flexible around academic achievements considering you know what's happened with the fiasco around results this year um, yeah. and next year you know in Scotland they're already saying that and Wales and already saying they're not going to be sitting A levels in GCSE next year I don't know I don't think they're still going ahead in England but so I think you know don't think too much about academics think about their potential and assessing you know, for, their, for aptitude and the ability to to, to learn and to grow um is is really important at this particular yep. time um and then um i think you know your process needs to be fair um you need to have a level playing field for all candidates um 
So it's uh, it is using that that data to make sure that um, that people are aren't being adversely impacted. We spoke about earlier, making sure everybody involved in the recruitment process is trained on mm. unconscious bias, and making sure they they understand your diversity ambitions as well. But also making sure that they are not bringing any bias into the into the um, into the process and the, and the hiring decisions that are being made, um, and then just tracking you know interrogate your data um, and measure where you're getting to so you've started as mentioned at the start you need to be really clear on what your diversity ambitions are um, but then you need to track it to make sure that you you're heading in the right direction but when we talk about diversity we also need to talk about inclusion right so if you've attracted yep. all of these people then how do you make sure that that you've got an inclusive environment where people are going to feel happy and comfortable coming to work as themselves um, and thrive within that environment so you can't talk about the two things separately they are together yep. Um, yep. and if you've got it right then it's a great thing to use within your 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 advertising and your attraction or your marketing as well and um, so people want to see people like them and hear stories from from people like them and so the whole thing kind of yeah it's all a puzzle <laughs> joined together yep. and if you do it right then you're treated to the good things Excellent. Makes makes a lot of sense. Could we have just one thing I thought was quite interesting when you were talking about um, accessibility, you, you made a great point around language and you mm. said you've seen uh, some atrocious uh, mm. job posting. Can we can we briefly talk about things that you should definitely not do, you know, when when you're thinking of job ads and, and, and how to attract? Because as you said, you know, you might think you have a fairly good job description or, 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 or advert yeah. and then you know, you really think, you think, yeah, that's great, but then someone else sees it and they think, oh, this is really not me or kind of, yeah, yeah how, how do you, you know, what are the things to avoid here? What are the things to actually yeah. be conscious about and things to do perhaps? Yeah, so a job advert should have kind of five things in it, right? So it's about the company, um, about the role, about the, the person's specification, the job skills and experience that person needs. Then there's the kind of uh, useful information like where they could, location salary and things mm -hmm. like that um and then yeah kind of what the what what the camera but the <laughs> so, but yeah probably yeah, how to apply and things like that yeah? yeah so i think um with the the about information you really need to bring to life the culture of the organization and if you are really keen on diversity inclusion you need to bring across that as well so if somebody looks at that that job bad and think actually yeah i could fit in there um mm. so talking about the mission but also about what the values and culture are the the job role needs to not be a long list of responsibilities it's more bringing to life the role and and um, what the purpose of the role is and what you'll bring to that organization and how it will fit into the overarching objective and mission of that organization um then, then then the key thing is around the the person specifications so the jobs so the skills experience um, and knowledge someone will need to be successful in that role and so often we see a massive great big long list of you need this this and this, this so it's thinking about what is really essential um and questioning yourself so mm -hmm. where pre in previous roles I've, I've been writing job descriptions you get this massive great, long list and then you have to just peel it back and think about what really is the essential things because you know people particularly females will only apply if they can tick every single box yeah. And males apparently around 60 yeah. percent um, so you know you don't want people to see this great big long list of like oh, i can't do that i can't do that I can't do it, and mm. then not apply so it's thinking about you know, really what is essential and you see quite often essential and desirable why do you have the desirable <laughs> get rid of that and um, so yeah and and then, then and then what you do is take that that essential and then design your recruitment process off the back of it um, and then you can, you've got a sort of, yeah, real robust set of criteria that you would then assess your candidates um, against through the process to see if they got it. Um, so I think, yeah, just being really clear and thinking about, yeah, and different ways that you can, people can demonstrate that they've got that skills, knowledge and behaviour um, rather than just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And um, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to finish. I kind of feel like we're, we're, we're focused a lot on the, you know, going back to the um, um, going back to COVID and how it has affected uh, the, the broader talent industry. I kind of felt like we, we we focused a lot on the negatives, but there must be some positive mm. that have come out of this situation. So maybe finish on a on a positive note and talk about yeah. those <laughs> if, if, there, if there are any, if there are any. But I kind of feel like there, there's some, some positives. Yeah. 
there are there are a lot of positives um, that have come out there. So I've mentioned one already, which is around the virtualization yep. of um, assessment processes, attraction activities, um, internships. Who'd have thought you could do a virtual internship uh, a few months ago so successfully? Um, so I think that virtualization is is, is a great advancement, um, and we'll see that continue to be embedded in 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 a lot of employers um, activities going forward so I think that's good I think the kickstart scheme is could be awesome I'm not Mm. yeah it's too early to say um (laughs) (laughs) I've seen quite a lot of employers uh, yeah applying so um yeah yeah, we'll see see how that works um and I hope a lot of those kickstart programs the individual do really well and then go on to apprenticeship schemes um also, I think around apprenticeships, the, the visibility um, of apprenticeships has been increased, a big focus on, on apprenticeships. I think historically people haven't really seen it as a viable alternative to university. But now, you know, we're in a really economic, economically difficult situation. So actually apprenticeships where you can go and get a degree and not have the debt of going to university might become more appealing. So, um, and, the, and you know, they're, they're the job from day one. So um, yeah, hopefully the people will be more positive um, about apprenticeships and people will be yeah. more keen to take them up and also to offer them. And then finally, I think, you know, I have been so impressed about, you know, the increased levels of altruism. People are helping other people um, mm. that are on levels I've never seen before um, just to be kind <laughs> and to yeah. help other people out. Um, and, and it's fantastic, you know, to see as a, as a nation we're all kind of pulling together into sport, particularly where you know, people have been made redundant. And I've seen amazing things happen on LinkedIn and connections being made and people recommending people. So, um, oh yeah, I think about that. That's just been fantastic, and yeah, hopefully that will continue way beyond uh, this pandemic. Yeah, amazing. And this is uh, I couldn't have hoped for a better finish. We'll definitely finish on a positive note. So thanks so much, Steph. Appreciate the time, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on the show uh, another time soon. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great.